Uh, welcome to join today's uh, uh, seminar. And uh, uh, just like usual, like you, uh, if you have a, uh, questions, please save that question at the end. And uh, if you are, uh, you know, in the auditorium, you can, I, I can, you know, hand the, the microphone to you. And if you are in the, uh, you know, online, uh, you can just turn on your camera, ask questions. And also you, you always can have the option to, to uh, you know, type the question in the chat box. So uh, I hope I, I will read that questions and, uh, you know, uh, our speaker can answer that. So for today, we will have uh, uh, Darcy uh, Freeman to give a, a, a talk. And, and before her presentation, I will uh, ask for uh, uh, our professor, uh, uh, Park Wild, to introduce our today's speakers. Park, you go ahead. Thank you, Jantel. It's uh, wonderful to have the opportunity to introduce uh, Dr. Darcy Friedman. Uh, she holds the Swetland Chair in Environmental Health Sciences and serves as the director of the Marianne Swetland Center for Environmental Health at Case Western Reserve University at the School of Medicine in Cleveland. And she has a research portfolio that includes developing policy and system, systems level interventions to promote health equity, addressing the complex interplay between public health and the environment. Um, she studies the intersection of health equity, food systems, and community engagement. Her research is funded by agencies including NIH and USDA, as well as foundations such as the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research. And she um, studies a number of food systems topics related to what she'll be talking about today. I especially wanted the chance to introduce Dr. Friedman because she's been so helpful to our research program um, I have a PhD student, Sarah John, who completed her program this past year, and we were working on the economics of incentive programs that operate through farmers markets. Um, Dr. Friedman is a leading light nationally on this topic, but I also caught on to uh, what her, her delightful combination is of both scholarship and research aspects of this line of work, but also a very practical approach to thinking through things like what type of computer system do people in the farmers markets that host this type of nutrition incentives programs need in order to log how much activity the farmers market has and um, what type of progress they're making towards their goals with this type of nutrition incentive. So you can see this requires a mix of both research skills and um, practical skills to actually have the research make an impact um, in the world around us. And so you can, you can just see how that connects to some of the spirit of our work at the Friedman School and why it's great to have uh, Dr. Friedman talking about mechanisms structuring nutrition equity in neighborhood-based food systems. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you so much, Park, and it's good to hear your voice. It's a little hard to see in the um, screenshot that you're in up there, but I um, am happy to be here with you today. And I'm gonna go ahead and pull up my slides. I, I Just to refresh, uh, I think the last time Park and I were talking were, was around this technology, which we call FM Tracks. And I'm happy to hear that, it, that you guys have found it to be a, a useful tool in the work that you're doing, amazing work that you're doing around nutrition incentive work. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. And um, you know, just saying thank you so much for inviting me to give a talk with the Friedman School Speaker Series. It's an honor to present to such an amazing group. Um, personally, many of my own academic people to watch are within your school. I wish I could be there with you in person uh, today, but I welcome you to join me virtually here in Cleveland. For those of you not familiar with Case Western, you can see this is a picture of our campus uh, in, the, in the city of Cleveland. And I want to take a moment to acknowledge the land that we are on at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, in recognizing the land upon which we at Case Western reside, I express gratitude and appreciation to those who lived and worked here before us, those whose stewardship and resilient spirit makes our residents possible on this traditional homeland. 
of the Lenape, Delaware, Shawnee, Wyandot, Miami, Ottawa, Potawatomi, and other Great Lakes tribes, including Chippewa, Kikapu, Wea, Pianquisha, and Kaskaskia. I also acknowledge the thousands of Native Americans who now call Northeast Ohio home. Case Western Reserve University and the greater Cleveland area occupy land officially ceded by 1,100 chiefs and warriors signing the Treaty of Greenville in 1795. I recognize that in the times following this treaty, there have been many other people who have tendered this land and pay homage to their commitment in caring for this sacred space. And I'd just like to take a moment of silence for each of us to acknowledge the land that we're on in all of this virtual landscape. And I'm also going to share in the chat um, a Facebook link to the Lake Erie Native American Council uh, that provides some opportunities to engage locally in uh, by offering your time, talent, and treasure. And I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to put it in the chat, but I can put it in later. Um, and I, you know, in the spirit of talking about food, and I guess it's lunchtime for many of us, I wanted to highlight one um, food space that I really like in Cleveland. This is the West Side Market. If you've ever been to Cleveland, um, you may have had the opportunity to visit. It's the oldest operating indoor and outdoor market space in the city. It was founded in 1840 and a very a diverse space in terms of the kinds of foods that you'll have on the outsides. You don't see it in here are the fruit and vegetable vendors, some of the best pastries you'll ever find in this market, um, as well as a lot of other really good things. So if you come to Cleveland, uh, take advantage of the West Side Market. And I also just want to give a quick plug for the Marion and Swetland Center for Environmental Health, uh, where I serve as the director. We're an academic research center housed in the School of Medicine at Case Western. We have a three-pronged approach in our work focused on research, training, and education, and community engagement. And our work centers around the goal of advancing community system science for environmental health equity. Within our center, our work is within three priority areas and food systems and health is, is a major area within our center. And of course, that's going to be the focus of my talk today. A lot of the things I'll talk about are going to be found on our website. So you can see it there, um, case.edu slash sweatland. And it does not look like it's easy for me to post in chat, but I'll try and do that a little bit later at the end uh, when I take these slides down. So today I'm going to be taking you on a journey, uh, sharing how we have been exploring opportunities to make a difference in the food system to improve health equity. And I just want to be fully transparent that my thesis is that food systems are critical to health and that we are not... Uh, they're not doing a good job at achieving that goal, particularly in racialized neighborhoods. As a community psychologist, my work has focused on the neighborhood level. This is not discounting other levels of the food system, but it does represent the boundaries that I'm applying to the research that I'm presenting today. This journey includes three components starting in 2015 when we received an R01 to evaluate a natural experiment, which was the food, a food hub opening in a neighborhood in Cleveland that had few stores selling fresh and healthy foods. It was a quasi-experimental design with a comparison community in Columbus, Ohio. And so you'll see on the chart here, uh, the axes of time and space. When, I, when I'm talking about space, uh, today, I'm largely talking about racialized urban neighborhoods, particularly within these two cities um, that have been the focus of our, our research. This led to our next study, uh, our participatory food systems modeling project, funded in 2018 by the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research and many matching partners. And this is going to be the primary focus of my uh, discussion today. And then over the past year, our team took insights from both of those studies and synthesized them into an intervention that we're calling Nourishing Power. And that was recently selected for funding as a renewal grant by the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research and matching funders. And we have a start date of April 1. So I'll end my talk uh, with a sneak peek into the new study, uh, but I'll 
I'll use it as a, as a teaser so we can uh, keep you interested in, in what's happening in the future. You've heard me say already racialized neighborhoods, and I wanted just to briefly define what I mean when I say racialize or racialization. Racialization is a process of assigning meaning to real perceived or ascribed differences between groups. And I put a little asterisk there. It could be between humans like people or it could be between non-humans like, like neighborhoods or, or other settings. And then making those differences the basis for distributing power and prestige. And that second part is really important in, in some of the dynamics that I'll be talking about. I could have used other words like historically segregated or historically marginalized or historically redlined, and all of them have strengths. Um, personally, I like to use the word uh, racialize as the um, term and, and because of this uh, definition right here. So in terms of my agenda today, I'm gonna to give you a little bit of background about our Food Hub Natural Experiment because it's, it laid the foundation for our modeling project. I'll then talk about the aims, goals, and approach of our participatory food systems modeling, some of our key findings, and then how we're starting to translate that out into a system level intervention. So <clears throat> our Food to Hub study was called the Future of Food in Your Neighborhood Study, affectionately known as Food Nest 2.0 by our team and participants. It was a natural experiment that provided an external evaluation of a healthy food financing funded food hub that was developed by a public private partnership in a majority African American neighborhood in Cleveland. This neighborhood has some of the highest rates of poverty in the city and Cleveland is marked as one of the highest poverty cities in the country. You can see this rendering here. Um, this was, you know, what the food hub was designed, you know, initial ideas of what the food hub would be. It was planned to address two mechanisms related to changing dietary behaviors, um, focusing on the built food environment to make fresh and healthy foods more accessible and affordable, and on the social food environment to promote social interactions, norms, and support related to fresh and healthy foods. Ultimately, not all components of the proposed food hub were implemented. And among those implemented, the dose and reach was low. The most significant component, implementation of the large food hub infrastructure was never developed. Um, and so long story short, you can tell by the title of our paper here, uh, while there were some very, very small, not uh, practically significant improvements in the urban food environment over our study time frame, which was three years, uh, there were no changes in diet among residents. And as we look to the broader literature on healthy food financing initiatives, we found that our results corroborated other studies. In short, these initiatives were not yielding the outcomes related to improvements in diet and the food retail environment overall. And so some of these findings we could potentially explain by a system science principle about delays between cause and effect. So there could be a delay between opening a grocery store in a neighborhood, for example, and then seeing dietary behaviors um, that are changing. And that might take longer than two or three years to materialize. But as we were doing this work and, and really trying to understand implementation, remember we were the external evaluators, we were not implementing the food hub, we, we started to do some interviews with people and we wanted to know what's going on here, how do you make sense of this? And in that process, we found these interdependencies related to the goals of the project. So for example, you know, was this food hub designed from a community focus to bring in insiders, to engage the insiders or the people living in the neighborhood, or was it designed to bring in outsiders? Um, another way that we were hearing some tensions is related to the pace of change. We heard from the private um, developer working on the project that he wanted to know, you know, didn't want things to move within months time so he could have the competitive advantage and nobody else would have, you know, developed whatever his idea was. Whereas the private or the public side of it 
wanted to get community feedback, wanted to hear, you know, how we should develop the, the food hub. Um, and of course, that's really important, but that, that was a much slower pace to the development. And just along the lines of food, because I know that's a focus um, of your school, is just this whole idea, are we talking about an intervention that's food as function, literally getting you a calorie or literally getting you a nutrient? Are we talking about an intervention that's really around food as culture and community building and identity formation and creation and, and things like that? And so all of these um, complexities about the tensions going on in the environment helped us see that, and I'm gonna to go to the green box first, we did study really well diet quality. We did 24 hour dietary recalls three times per year. Um, we had really good measures of objective food environment. We went into every store, we followed the NEMS. I mean, we were doing it all like the, the, the books. We measured perceived food environments really well. We measured food insecurity really well. But what we were not studying were the connections between the food hub and other interventions that were taking place in the context. So for example, a healthy corner store project or a nutrition incentive program or a farmer's market project. Uh, we were not studying at all how negotiations were being made between the public and private partners about the food hub. We weren't studying capital development. And you know, this was a huge funded project, HHF, HFFI grant, Kresge Foundation grant. I mean, again, these were all the external partners got those. Um, and you know, we weren't really seeing how um, this capital was being managed and um, uh, allocated for various different uh, components of the project. We were not understanding how they were building up their capacity to actually implement this model. And, and we weren't understanding the organizational capacity to even manage this initiative. And you know, unfortunately, one year after our grant ended, the whole thing went in foreclosure and um, you know, nothing is there today related to the original Food Hub concept, except for a brewery uh, in the community. So, you know. It was clear in that work that food systems research is messy and our current methods were not adequately accounting for the dynamics of local food systems. So we wanted to take a step back and ask ourselves what type of study would help us learn about the complexity of the food system while also preparing for strategic action. And so that sort of became the uh, premise for our new study uh, which is now an old study, but it but the new at that time, uh, we we really were creative. We called it Food Nest 2.0, uh, and we called it the Modeling the Future of Food in Your Neighborhood Study. You can see on the slide the end goal of this study was to develop credible and relevant decision support tools to offer a systems lens within an equity framework to guide sustainable local food system development. I highlighted a few words that are really important to our approach, one of them being credible and relevant. We're now diving into complexity. We knew if we're going under the hood and getting in the complicated space, we had to do it in a way that people could understand and digest and believe at the end. Um, and so we did a lot of steps and you'll hear about our participatory approach to make sure it was credible, um, to be responsive and relevant, um, particularly, we didn't know at the time in 2018, but relevant even in the midst of a COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we, uh, our whole study was about looking at this as a system problem rather than the problem of one piece of the puzzle. And then throughout the entire project, we, we applied an equity framework. And that's something you're gonna hear more I'll talk about is how that evolved as we were working on the project. We use a methodology called participatory system dynamic modeling, and I'll explain more what that is in a minute. But I like this visualization to help you understand why participatory system dynamic modeling is a good approach for this kind of work. And this is, you know, I know probably all of us have seen this image before, the big elephant, we're all coming in um, blind and sort of touching different pieces of the elephant. And if I'm touching the tail and you're touching the tusk, we might think that we're touching something different, 
But when we're able to sit there together and see that actually these are all piecing together into one thing. There is this thing called an elephant and we've been able to come together and we might only know our own piece of it, but it is about something bigger and something connected. And so we applied um, common methods within community-based system dynamics. Uh, this is a wonderful reference if you're new to this uh, methodology. Peter Hoffman is actually a colleague of mine at Case Western. He came here a couple of years ago. Uh, but some of the principles of uh, system, community-based system dynamics is this idea of co-generation of models, a focus on multiple sources of information. So you'll see we're not saying data necessarily, information to guide model development. Uh, it is interactive and iterative. Um, I'm going to be presenting on models that took three years to develop. And, and honestly, we, we could keep developing those over time, but they're designed to understand the structure of the system as well as the behavior that the system produces. Uh, we look at feedback mechanisms. This is sort of a hallmark of system dynamics. So we're, we're not looking at you know, linear relationships. We're really looking at circular feedback loops. And so, um, Within those, we're trying to identify interdependencies among feedback. Another thing um, that's, that's a, a feature of this approach is an exploration between those time delays, like we mentioned earlier, how long would it take? Um, are there delays between this happening and this happening? And then lastly, this focus on examining leverage points. Um, and in particular for us, we were interested in points for transformation toward, again, that goal of equity. It was uh, a community or it is a community academic research partnership. Um, here's a picture of our team in 2019. I believe that picture is from. Um, we were pre-COVID meeting together. Uh, our team had about 20 community members and 10 academic partners throughout, although the composition changed slightly over the years. Some people got new jobs, some people had babies, some people moved. Um, but we always maintained about 30 members within the core modeling team. And as a community um, collaborative project, one of the things that we spent a lot of time on over the course of the project, we, we developed and we refined were our values and our assumptions. And these both were important for how we interacted together, but also gives you some insights into the assumptions underpinning the modeling work uh, that we were doing. And so I'm just gonna read these briefly. Uh, we acknowledge that every system is perfectly designed to achieve the results that, achieve, that it achieves. And of course, this is sort of a truism of system science. Um, and we know uh, that the results of the system right now, and I'm not presenting on the data today because I didn't wanna waste time on something I figure everybody in this circle probably already knows, but we know that these trends of entrenched inequities related to food insecurity, diet quality, um, you know, diet-related health conditions are, are entrenched and they are persistent, they are resistant, um, and they are the result of the system as it is now. We, we see systems change as being both possible. So sometimes you're like, oh, but we never could do it, but we came in saying, yes, we think we could. And it also requires collective understanding of complexity, connections, and dynamics. We believe the food system requires engagement from a range of stakeholders, all have a place at the table. We assume that trust is a catalyst to systems change and collaboration and transparency are necessary to build trust. Some of that relates to our goal of credibility. Uh, we did a lot of trust building work and I can, in the Q&A, could talk more about that. Uh, but this was a key feature to our approach. And we focused on equity as both the process in terms of how we were working to even do this research, and then as an outcome, what was it that we hoped to achieve? Um, our work should allow for illumination of existing injustices of the food system. So we sort of held ourselves accountable. You know, does this help us see how racism is baked into the food system? Some of our earlier presentations of our models 
Uh, some external partners gave feedback to say, hey, we don't see racism in your model. Help us understand where that is. And then provide guidance for addressing these dynamics. And then our work is iterative and adaptive and always open to uh, or open for deliberation, that it's a living process. And so to the next set of slides um, are coming from a paper that we published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. Uh, here's the reference for that paper. And uh, I wanted to start off giving you a sense of our design, our participants and activities that were conducted from 2018 to 2021. So I've already mentioned our core modeling team. Again, this is very commonly applied in uh, participatory system dynamic modeling. Uh, we had about 10, 10 academic partners, and you can see a variety of disciplines involved. And then we had 20 community collaborators representing different places in the food system, um, and, you know, and people with lived experience, people in food justice work. Uh, so those, that was a, a very dynamic group involved in the core modeling team. I'm gonna then follow down. Everybody in the core modeling team was involved in our participatory modeling workshops. In our paper, you can go to an appendix and read about all the workshops that we did. We did a total of about 20 over the course of about two years um, or about two and a half years. There were small group, large group sessions. There are scripted activities. There is a resource online called Scriptopedia. And we borrowed a lot from those existing models for how to do uh, participatory modeling workshops. Um, in addition, we had interviews. So we knew that um, this team was wonderful and provided great expertise, but we felt like we were missing some perspectives from the modeling team, in part because some folks did not have the capacity or interest in, in joining um, the model. The core modeling team met every other month for um, two to four hours, and then they would do a summer retreat. So it was a fairly intense commitment to be on the modeling team. The key informant, key informant interviews were conducted with 22 people, and we focused on three stakeholder groups. So we looked at residents within um, the neighborhoods that were the focus of the project, food retailers, and then uh, people that we called regulators of the food system. These were people that might have the strings to pull the levers, uh, government officials, funders, folks like that. And then the third um, data source were our public workshops or convenings. So these were recruited in partnership with our Food Policy Coalition and other stakeholder groups. We had a total of six. One of them was very large, about 150 people, a day-long event where we shared, shared the results of our first round of modeling at the end of year one. And then our subsequent convenings were smaller, 15 to 20 or 15 to 30 people. And these were more um, interactive sessions trying to figure out how do we take the modeling insights and think about leverage points for change in the food system. So in terms of analysis, we use an iterative and deliberative analytic approach. Um, we had qualitative coding of any of the qualitative data. We use inductive analysis as well as deductive analysis based on themes coming from these emergent causal loop diagrams. And causal loop diagramming was our primary analytic tool. Causal loop diagramming is a qualitative system uh, dynamic modeling method. And in, in this process, and you're gonna see these in a minute, so I'm not gonna go over all of their details, but the, the features of a causal loop diagram is the identification of reinforcing loops. So feedback loops that are accelerating growth or decline, and then balancing loops that are sort of bringing the system back into homeostasis. So you can't only have reinforcing loops, otherwise it would just go out of control. Something's always pulling it back, and so that was sort of our goal in the work was to identify both um, the reinforcing and the balancing loops. And, and you can see the photos here are various, you know, very interactive, you know, low tech kind of engagement that we would then convert into. We did use some modeling software like Stella, Architect, and uh, Vensim, uh, qualitative coding software like Envivo, 
but almost everything was starting from uh, you know, more low tech forms of data gathering. So now let's transition into our findings. One of the first findings that came out of this work were the key indicators of racial equity of neighborhood-based food systems. And so you can see here, um, the three were first, economic opportunity. So do residents have sufficient financial resources to freely meet basic food needs? Secondly, food security. Can residents consistently meet household food needs with dignity? And I think that last piece with dignity is an important um, feature to our definition of food security. And then thirdly, fair access to fresh and healthy food. Is quality and affordable food supply aligned with consumer demand so people can get the foods they want? And you can see on the side here, um, this is an example of a trend line or a graph over time. This is a common, uh, this is more of a qualitative depiction of what that might look like. But, but what these indicators sort of refer to would be trends, trend lines you would want to monitor in neighborhoods and sort of use them as the needles. Like, how are we doing on these three main outcomes? Um, are, are these, and these being three that are key to our understanding of racial equity in neighborhood-based food systems. From this work, we identified an emergent concept of nutrition equity. And so all, or even early on in the modeling work, we kept saying like, gosh, there seems like there's something up here, like a third dimension of this model it does, it's not really in any of the loops, it's sort of above all of the loops. And eventually, and I mean, really, this took us a long time to get here, we, um, we came up with this idea of a third dimension that we're calling nutrition equity. We see nutrition equity as um, comprised of food security, fair access and economic opportunity, but it's not an additive. It's not like those three together make nutrition equity. It's something bigger than those three, although those are part of the, um, the puzzle. We collectively defined nutrition equity as freedom, agency, and dignity in food traditions, resulting in people and communities healthy in body, mind, and spirit. And all of those words are really important, things that we could come back to later, lots of time spent in the group on the meaning of those words and why they were important to include in uh, this definition. And so now I'm gonna shift over and start to show some of the um, modeling, uh, the causal loop diagrams. But I wanna share this quote first because I think it gives you a, like that high level story of, of what, what we learned. Uh, and this is a resident, they said, you know, what makes a healthy food system? that's kind of hard to even single out because it's so many other pieces. And that idea of, of like that elephant, right? There's just so many different things and it isn't even possible for us to map all of those out and think about the interconnections. And so here is the uh, causal loop diagram that we call our full model. Do not worry about reading this. I wanna just pull a couple of key points out and then I'm gonna break these out into um, smaller submodels in a second. So a couple of things that I want to point out, of course, you can see a lot of arrows that have a sign, either positive or negative. That's telling you the polarity of the relationship. It's either a direct relationship, things are moving in the same direction, or an indirect, they're moving in the opposite direction. So if something gets better, um, you know, if one thing goes up, the other one might go down if it's in a negative direction. The other feature on here, you'll see these little arrows, the circular arrows, those are um, indicative of feedback loops. Again, I'm gonna talk about those in a, a minute, um, so don't worry about them. I just wanted to highlight that nomenclature. And then thirdly on here, you'll see these orange colored um, terms. One of the things that you have to do in modeling is put boundaries on the work that you're doing because truly when you're thinking in systems, everything is connected. And there's no way um, that your team has the, of 30 people, our team had the capacity to model everything. And so we had to make decisions in part based on what did we have the expertise to model 
and what did we have the time capacity to model? And so the things that are on here in, in orange represent things that we say are exogenous to the system that we are modeling, but we think they are important to the system. So for example, in the top, you have voter participation. We have identified that as being an exogenous factor. If something changes related to voter participation, it goes up or it goes down within racialized neighborhoods, we are saying it will have an effect on this whole system, but we did not have the expertise in our team to model out all of the dynamics related to why you know, people are voting and all the factors influencing voter participation. But I think it's important to note because you can start to see how you know, these more even further upstream factors like gerrymandering, which is something in my state that's going on a, a very hot discussion right now, um, ultimately, you know, has an impact on, on racialized uh, food systems within neighborhoods. And as we started to think about, you know, what are the high level lessons of our work? Um, where are these points of leverage for transformation? We're reminded this is really borrowing on work of uh, Danella Meadows, who's a systems scientist. Uh, but this is actually a paper from a, a food systems uh, modeling project that I think was really interesting. But the main point I want to make to you here is that the level of impact, so low level impact is changing structural elements like actors and elements. And much of what we've been doing, for example, putting in one new store in a community, extremely complicated. I don't want to discredit how hard that is to do, but we're not really changing the structure of the system at all. Whereas as you go up this pyramid, you can see when you're thinking about changing goals and ultimately changing paradigm, you're having much greater effect because remember that principle of systems, they're designed to achieve their goals. And so as we thought about what were the main insights from our modeling work, um, the most important thing that we feel like we learned was related to that emergent concept of nutrition equity. And that we saw that as a goal to guide food systems work in racialized neighborhoods. And again, you can see our definition here of nutrition equity. And within there, we saw these feedback mechanisms that structure nutrition equity. One of them was around meeting basic food needs with dignity, supply and demand dynamics, and then community empowerment and food sovereignty. And then within each of these three domains, we found 10 feedback mechanisms that sort of accelerate or delay movement toward that, that goal um, of each of the domains. And at the bottom, you can see those exogenous factors. I think it's really important to note Prior to COVID, we had identified neighborhood crisis as a key exogenous factor structuring food systems in uh, racialized neighborhoods. And if you look in this picture here, you'll see crisis popping up everywhere. And of course, no surprise when COVID came in a major neighborhood crisis, one of the first things that we heard was, wow, what is it gonna do to the food system? And if, you know, how's the food system gonna respond? So breaking these out a little bit more, our first domain focused on meeting basic food needs with dignity. Within this domain, we had three or four feedback mechanisms. And of these, you can see that three of them are balancing loops. And one of them is a reinforcing. Again, balancing is bringing you back into homeostasis. So why were there so many protective layers to bring you back to homo homeostasis in the um, basic food needs domain? And it's because humans need to eat food. At some point, we have to have a way to bring ourselves back into homeostasis of, you know, of food security, or at least being able to eat a little bit of food or else we won't survive. And so you can see each of these layers that comes out. If I'm not, if I have a gap in my ability to meet household food needs, I might need a side hustle, or I might need to get some other benefits, or I might need to get some SNAP, or I might need to get some emergency food assistance. 
And, and these layer out as, you know, actually a fairly well, well established anti-hunger program. And I think the result of 50 years of work around hunger relief efforts in the nation. What we learned when we started to unpack these feedback loops a little bit more, I'm just gonna give you a couple of examples. So this is the side hustle loop, B1. So if I have a gap in my ability to meet my household food needs, it might cause me to have a side hustle. And if I get some income from that, I might close, you know, get more money for my household food budget, more money for my food budget. I have better ability to meet my household food needs and my gap is gonna go down. And so then I may, may not need to do a side hustle because I, I resolve my problem, but now I'm gonna have fewer, um, fewer resources available. And so you can see how this sort of would oscillate of, you know, I have the resources, then I don't, then I go back in side hustle, then I, you know, kind of go back and forth. We define side hustle feedback mechanism as work in the invisible economy, like babysitting, cleaning, hair, or beauty used to meet food, household food needs during times of struggle. Yet their transitional and underground nature results in unstable flow of resources. And here's a quote um, from a participant. I do freelance work when I can, when it presents itself, but it's infrequent and far between. And the sales of my albums and my books and things like that hasn't done much to supplement our income e either. So yeah, basically it's been a struggle. And then another uh, really important feedback loop that we identified here is the stigma and stereotypes loop. And this is the only reinforcing loop. So again, reinforcing loops are gonna either accelerate or decline um, the, the, the way that the system is working or the way that the system is operating. And so here we found that negative views about people and groups struggling to meet basic food needs may delay access to food assistance resource, which means these programs are less effective because they're not being accessed or they take longer to close the gap to achieve food security. And a, a participant said, I mean, those that can go to the food pantry, but choose not to because they don't want to be seen with the food on the bus for whatever reason, or it could be a pride thing. And so this is an example where you could think about interventions to try and reduce stigma as a way to sort of more quickly close the gap between a food assistant or food you know, insecurity need and food security status. Our second domain was focused on balancing supply and de demand dynamics for fresh and healthy foods. Within here, we saw three uh, feedback loops, one related to uh, healthy food retail, job security, and food culture and norms. And I'll give the example of food culture and norms in this one. Um, and you can see up here in the green, I have shaded this loop R4. And it's the relationship between willingness to pay for fresh and healthy foods. So, so my willingness over time is gonna influence my preference for fresh and healthy foods, which is gonna influence my purchasing, which may also then influence my um, willingness to pay. And you can see this is reinforcing. So the more that this happens, the more willing, the more I'm gonna like it, the more I might be willing to buy it. Um, the, the key thing here are these delay marks between willingness to pay and preference. So I might, just because I'm willing to pay, maybe I got a stimulus check in my uh, pocket last month, doesn't mean that tomorrow I like fresh and healthy foods. And so there is a time delay between that cause and that effect. Um, here, um, we define it saying traditions established over the life course that shape food preferences, purchasing, and consumption patterns. These embedded beliefs are hard to change, yet have the potential for transformation. And here's a quote from a participant. People are so used to what they're used to, and it's easier to eat unhealthy because it tastes good. And so, I mean, of course, you in your school know these, these truths so much, um, but oftentimes we're doing studies where we think that we could change preferences and purchasing and consumption within three months. Um, and I, you know, not taking into account all these other dynamics that are also driving one's willingness to pay uh, for fresh and healthy foods. 
And then the third domain, community empowerment and food sovereignty. To be honest, when we wrote the grant, we kind of had a hunch, and I'm sure you guys could guess too, that the emergency food supply was gonna be a part of our model and the market-based food supply was gonna be a part of our model, but this was really an emergent property of the modeling around community emp empowerment and food sovereignty. And within here, there were three different um, feedback loops around community power, urban agriculture, and risk for gentrification. And, and this particular feedback loop had the most overarching effect on different dimensions of the food system um, within our modeling work within uh, racialized urban neighborhoods. So the community power um, loop, it's actually very hard to show you in a picture because it sort of extends um, across uh, different dimensions. And you know, it's coming in, that's where that voter register or voter participation feature is such an important driver of the system overall. But we define this as collective power mobilized through social capital and policy engagement to transform the forces shaping community capacity to nurture dignified and flourishing lives through community-driven change. And here's a quote by a food retailer. They said, I think community has all the control. I don't know if we utilize it to the best of our ability, but I think the community has all the control. If there's a food system of any sort that is in the community that doesn't work, I've seen communities stand up and say, we don't want this here like this. We don't like this. This doesn't work for us. This isn't what we want. Anytime a community comes together and says that, whatever it is has to go. And then on the other side, um, we found this balancing loop. So this is one of those, again, pulling it back to homeostasis. We may be developing healthy food retail and this might pull it back. Um, and we define this as unintended consequences of food retail development in neighborhoods with a history of disinvestment. This fear may counter efforts aimed at growing new food retail options in racialized neighborhoods and reinforces the importance of having community ownership of local food systems change. And this is such a poignant quote here uh, from a resident. They said, you know, I saw all these other restaurants and, that, and healthy stuff that's coming to the neighborhood and we pay attention to what's coming. So a lot of us that's awake, we pay attention. The bike lanes, we don't ride no bikes. Who is these for anyway? So I wanna um, just, as I'm ending the model presentation, I just wanna draw our attention to this quote right here. This is a paper on uh, modeling within public health. And it says the nature of public health means that social dynamic models will always be fluid subjective and non-holonomic, meaning the model will depend on the process as much as the fundamental social conditions and data. And, and so the models that I just presented to you are a product of our process. Um, they were a very useful tool for us to understand what were some of the dynamics structuring food systems in racialized neighborhoods. We don't think these are the models for they may be very relevant to many other communities. We don't necessarily think they apply to every other community. I think there's a lot of things that could be um, uh, tested and explored, but we definitely see that these would be changing and evolving over time, um, You know, kind of like this quote says. Another big feature of the work of our project was to not only translate our science for a scientific or academic audience, we also created community-focused outputs so one of those main tools is the menu of actions for community-driven food systems change. Um, this is a, a very nice resource that kind of walks people through our overall insights um, and also gives examples of identified um, targets for action within the food system to tip it to fairness. And, and those, are, um, those are resources that we'd be happy to share. In addition, uh, we created a food systems change vision board toolkit. This is a resource that helps community members take their ideas about food system change, kind of leaning into that community empowerment, food sovereignty, domain of feedback, um, walks them through. And if you're familiar with things like business model canvas, we applied a lot of those principles and created 
um, a, an actual canvas or a vision board canvas um, that kind of goes along with this toolkit. And at the end of our project, we pilot tested a food systems change fellowship, which was sort of our first launch into how do we take these insights and work in solidarity with community members to think about the development of community-driven food system change. So this is an example of one of our fellows from last year, Ms. Kelly Etheridge. Uh, you can see her here in the purple shirt. She does a lot of great work around children and healthy food access. And actually, she just was recruited to become a nutrition educator with a local nonprofit in Cleveland, um, in part uh, had the opportunity afforded because of her experiences through the fellowship. So that's really exciting to see how this work is sort of taking people to the next level, building capacity. Um, and then another thing that we did was uh, we knew, again, remember that community uh, power uh, feedback loop, we knew that um, ultimately politics and elected officials would influence the local food system. Cleveland had a mayoral election this past fall. And so we were able to work with about 10 community leaders, some of them from our modeling um, group and some from outside. And they, and including an advisory council of the Sweatland Center, they were able to write an op-ed that published in our major newspaper in the city, as well as an online newspaper resource, um, really calling out the new mayor to prioritize food justice as a part of his broader uh, focus in, um, in his policy agenda. So I wanna just sort of wrap up by just thinking about the key implications for food systems and health equity based on the research that we've done. I think first we, we are seeing that the work we've done helps us see how to root food systems change in values of freedom, agency, and dignity. And I, you know, we don't need to go into it, and we could in a discussion, all, the values that currently drive food systems are really not these values. And so, you know, what would it mean to shift and prioritize those values? We also highlighted this three-dimensional target for neighborhood-based food systems change for racial equity, including economic opportunity, food security, and fair access. And those 10 feedback mechanisms that depending on the different communities and, and you know, their own needs and opportunities, they could be tailored to target for food systems transformation. Fourthly, our work highlights that this is not just about chronic disease prevention, it's not just about physical health, but when we're talking about the food system, we're talking about holistic levels of change and thinking about change of body, mind and spirit. This is something our partners really pushed us on. In our original modeling work, we had chronic disease as one of the um, boxes in the model. And they said, you know, it doesn't matter if I don't have diabetes, but I'm addicted, or I don't have a diabetes, but I'm, um, you know, I have no hope about what's coming up. It doesn't matter. And so we, we, of course, you can see in our definition, we've integrated that language. And then lastly, that nutrition equity is about a process, how we do some, it's not about checking a box, but it's about how we do and how we do ongoing, as well as the equitable outcomes that we would hope to see over time. So just very briefly, what's next? Um, we are going to be kicking off a new study in April. We're calling it the Nourishing Neighborhoods Empowering Community Study. It will be co-led by Sweatland Center, as well as the FAIR Project, which is a local nonprofit that does uh, food justice work, as well as Neighborhood Connections, which is a Cleveland-based uh, community-focused grant-making system. It's a multi-component system-level intervention. You can see the different components here around leadership development, funding of nutrition equity work, networking, and then a fellow, similar to the fellowship you saw earlier, uh, a fellowship process to build capacity among um, emergent leaders in the food system space. Our end goal in this project is to evaluate the impact on who guides decisions for local food systems change, who is getting funded to implement change strategies, and the extent to which efforts center lived experiences of Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities. And our intended benefits, uh, we're hoping to see increasing dignified experiences, 
related to securing basic food needs, better balance of supply and demand for fresh and healthy foods, and expanded community empowerment, empowerment and ownership of food systems change. So I wanna end just, um, I'm gonna have a bunch of slides here with a bunch of names. And to be honest with you, it's humbling to see all these names. This is a collaborative work. There are many, many people. Some of them are even on the call today. It's wonderful to see them on here. Um, but these were all of the partners that have been involved in our modeling work, in our dissemination work, our translation work. And I also wanna acknowledge our funders. If you're not familiar with the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research, it's a national foundation. Uh, that is our primary funder and it requires a dollar for dollar match. So all of these other funders were key to uh, making the project possible. So with that, I'll conclude uh, putting up my email and my Twitter information. And I also wanted to highlight, we do have a couple of jobs coming up soon in the Swetland Center, a community nutrition research manager and a postdoctoral scholar, which will actually be working on the nourishing power study. And within the nutrition department at Case Western, um, we do have uh, some fact, uh, one or more faculty positions, and I can uh, send updates if folks are interested in that um, in the future. So with that, I'm going to pull my slides down and I can bring them up if people have specific questions. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Darcy, for the talk. And the question floor is open. Any questions in the auditorium and the Zoom? Yeah, yeah I, can, I can pass that. There's a, there a question in, in the auditorium. Okay. All right, uh, thank you for this. Uh, my name is Alexandra Thorne. I've, I'm actually just teaching a class on food systems modeling and we're gonna be doing system dynamics modeling in like two weeks. So this is like perfect timing for us. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the quantitative side of the modeling. You mentioned Stella and some of the other uh, tools. I was particularly curious in your um, in your network influence diagrams, like which of those are just influence, like the circles on Stella, as opposed to stocks and flows with the rectangles, and uh, how the, how that's broken down, and how you used it also, because I don't think I've seen a lot of using real systems dynamics modeling in a participatory process, and what you've done is great. Yeah, so that's a great question. So there's the, the causal loop diagrams and then kind of translating those into stock and flow simulation models. We did create simulation models as a part of the work. We actually created three different simulation models. One that was more food security focus, one economic opportunity focus, and one that was um, food access focus. So those three main outcomes. And from that, um, we some of the concepts in the models became, in the causal loop diagrams became even more clear. So for example, risk of gentrification. That was something in our economic development model. It was clear that food retail development was very likely to increase housing, uh, housing prices and, um, you know, op things in the neighborhood that it wasn't likely to create a lot of jobs. Because if you think about like, let's say a, a, a cafe, a healthy cafe, I mean, it's not that many jobs that it creates. And then all of a sudden it's this hot place, more people want to go there, suddenly people are aware. And so that helped us affirm what was in the causal loop diagram. Uh, we did not, I, I will be honest with you, our community partners did not have a lot of trust in simulation models as a tool for other than a heuristic tool. So we would say, okay, let's, I mean, we, we were planning to do a lot more simulation modeling and they would just critique everything out of it. It was like, I don't believe this. I don't believe that. I don't believe this. I don't. And so remember we were about credible and relevant. And so we came back to where the community partners felt the most comfortable. So we had a lot of learnings from the simulation models, but we ended up not fully calibrating them and validating them because the team um, decided they wanted to go, you know, in some of these other directions. Okay, it's about the time. I think, you know, I, I, I'm, 
there must be more questions you want to ask. Maybe if you have more questions, maybe you can uh, contact Dr. Uh, Darcy Freeman uh, directly. You know, I have to stop here because uh, uh, you know people will use this auditorium. Thank you so much again for the nice presentation. Let's have another round of uh, applause. Thank you. Okay. Thanks.